hearing me as well as you are seeing me today i am going to speak on approach to synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow in the next 30 40 minutes we will be uh, discussing about specifically approach to synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow this topic is chosen because this kind of case will be kept commonly in the exam and a lot of examiners are interested passionate about asking the differential diagnosis of synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow so the fascination of pediatric cardiology is due to its complexity for an example tetralogy of fallow let us say tetralogy of fallow you have a ventricular septal defect and right ventricular outflow tract obstruction the vsc may be mal aligned or outflow extension or inflow extension or there may be additional vsc similarly rv vertigo may be valvular infantricular or combination and branch psc noses right aortic cord and coronary anomaly so at the end of the diagnosis you come with an answer that one case will not mimic the other and you will come to a clinical diagnosis of this is the particular scenario and you will be excited about the diagnosis so that's the reason each case will not mimic the other congenital heart disease that's why the fascination of pediatric cardiology is due to its complexity let us go to the vsc with the ps physiology this is otherwise known as top physiology so in tetralogy of fallow physiology that doesn't mean all cases are po air but a synoptic congenital heart disease with admixture either at the atrial ventricular or great vessel level with obstruction to the pulmonary blood flow is known as psc ps physiology so essentially there is a ventricular septal defect there is right ventricular outflow tract obstruction so you have various varieties of subtypes uh, which i will be talking in next 2 minutes let us look at the classification of congenital heart disease so generally speaking the synoptic congenital heart diseases are uh, congenital heart diseases are asynoptic and synoptic in asynoptic there is an increased pulmonary blood flow or obstruction to the blood flow either systemic or pulmonary whereas in synoptic congenital heart disease they have reduced pulmonary blood flow mixed pulmonary blood flow and you have various examples in reduced pulmonary blood flow classical example is tetralogy of fallow whereas in mixed pulmonary blood flow with increased pulmonary blood flow you have tfv or transfer and other things so that is a general classification i am going to deal with a synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow today morning so if you look at the various congenital heart disease but you have to divide into hemodynamic subtypes the hemodynamic subtypes are asynoptic congenital heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow in the pre tracheal patient or post tracheal patient classical example of post tracheal patient is ventricular septal defect similarly obstruction to the blood flow either pulmonary or systemic or synoptic congenital heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow or synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow so i hope you are seeing this slide a hemodynamic classification at a clinical correlation a synoptic congenital heart disease can be hemodynamically subclassified into synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow synoptic with increased pulmonary blood flow and optimal pulmonary blood flow based on this you know that the presentation of the case whereas reduced pulmonary blood flow they will have synoptic and synoptic cells increased pulmonary blood flow they will have uh, synoptic and heart failure whereas optimal pulmonary blood flow there may not be any significant symptom again based on the clinical scenario you have left ventricular dominance right ventricular dominance in all of these settings so i am going to discuss in detail how to identify all these conditions so general approach include you have seven steps of 
congenital heart disease. Uh, seven steps to, to diagnose congenital heart disease. The step one is evaluation of history and synopsis. Step two is how to identify the ventricular dominance, whether it is left ventricular, right ventricular, or biventricular dominance. Step three is identification of the great vessel relation, whether it is a normal, demolpose, or l -molpose. Then you will be authoritating and finding about the second heart sound nature, whether it is single, loud, or what is the second heart sound. Then murmur. After that is either depending on the clinical scenario, you choose chest x-ray or electrocardiogram and of course eventually echocardiogram will give you the final diagnosis. It's an integral part of your clinical diagnosis. So let us see evaluation of sinusitis. Always you should rule out breath holding cells. In my clinical practice, nearly 5% of the babies that they refer to us. Uh, to rule out congenital heart disease with the history of breath holding cells. I am sure that you all know that breath holding cells typically child will have an episode of sinusitis, incessant crying and uprolling of eyeballs and all. Usually it is preceded by some kind of unhappiness in the family. Child wants something parent they don't give and the child typically uh, will uh, develop an episode of a breath holding cell. So acrosinosis, that is peripheral sinusitis, any neonate brought from village to tertiary hospital, then they develop acro peripheral sinusitis because of the exposure to the atmosphere at a low temperature. And sometimes a critical uh, a heart failure patient because of the low cardiac output, they will have a little bit of peripheral sinusitis, that is because of the more amount of oxygen extraction from the peripheral circulation. So they will have reduced hemoglobin in the venous system. You all know that oxygen extraction is 25 to 30. If it is more during a heart failure, then there will be duskiness and appearance. So let us see the acrosinosis. Generally, you can see here the lips and the tongue are spared, whereas the peripheries, uh, the soul and palms are blue here. Whereas central sinusitis typically lips, tongue, nail beds are involved. So in peripheral sinusitis, this is a very, very transient sinusitis, may last in 48 to 72 hours, and usually the peripheries are cold and capillary filling is somewhat delayed. Whereas in case of central sinusitis, the peripheries are warm, capillary filling is normal, whereas Sinosis increases when child cries because of the demand of more of oxygen due to increased cardiac output. So I want to you people to understand, to write down some of these things. I am sure that if you send me email, I can send this entire PowerPoint to you. It's a teaching session. You all should know basic fundamentals of differences between cardiac and respiratory sinosis. So in cardiac sinusitis, these babies are comfortable at rest, whereas the respiratory, that is due to respiratory infection, lower respiratory infection, whatever it is, they, they always will have some kind of respiratory distress. What sense with the crying is seen commonly in the cardiac because I already told you during crying that they act like an exercise, there will be really increase of cardiac output, more amount of oxygen, so more amount of the sinusitis will be Thing. Whereas in case of respiratory, the sinusitis improves with the crying because chain takes a deep respiration and more respiration, more oxygenation and sinusitis disappears. Similarly, the resting CO2 levels will be lesser than 60, more than 100. Whereas in cardiac, the CO2 levels will not be increased more than 100, even if you give 100% oxygen. Whereas in case of respiratory, the CO2 levels will go more than 200 percent. So you have pulse oximeter and examination of cardiovascular system will show the murmurs in case of cardiac, ECG x-ray will be abnormal, everything will be normal except x-ray will show the pneumonia. So I am going to ask you whether you all should know what is hyperoxia test, what is the virginal hyperoxia test when you take arterial blood gas sample both before and after oxygenation 
and now the modification of the hyperoxy attach using only pulse activator because practically it is not possible to give 100 percent oxygen intubation and take blood gas in all children. That is why now present days you take only pulse oximetry, pulse oximeter plethysmography and check the saturation whether it is increasing more than 10 percent or not. So, I want you to know all this hyperoxia test before going for the examination or it is important during your clinical practice. So, when you see sinusitis, sinusitis clinically you can appreciate when the saturation is lesser than 85 percent. So, your eyes cannot detect sinusitis if the saturation is more than 85 percent and the reduced hemoglobin should be more than 5 grams. So, now imagine a child who has anemia of 6 grams and you are talking about sinusitis. To have sinusitis, the reduced hemoglobin should be more than 5 grams. So, practically in the presence of anemia, these patients are more symptomatic because of the low oxygenation and the uh, anemia which is the oxygen carrying capacity is substantially low and clinically sinusitis may not be that appreciable in case of uh, anemia with the sinotic congenital heart disease. So, what are the conditions which produce mild sinusitis? I am talking about sinotic congenital heart disease reduced pulmonary blood flow where you expect sinusitis, but there are certain congenital heart diseases where you may not clinically really appreciate severe sinusitis, but if you carefully examine or if you make them to do exercise, you appreciate some sinusitis, corrected PJ, VSC, PS, pink tetrazo fellow, VSC pulmonary fissure with adequate pulmonary blood flow, where collateral are seen that you will appreciate a lot of continuous murmur. These are the cases, so they are sinotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow but the clinically detectable sinusitis is somewhat really less. So, you will be able to diagnose based on the pulse oximeter. So, VSC, PS, physiology, these are all various clinical subtypes. The clinical subtypes are tetralogy of halo, double outlet right ventricle VSC, PS and the single ventricle with the PS, tricuspid atresia with the PS, DTJ with the PS, LTJ with the PS and a V septal defect with the pulmonary stimulus. These are all various things that you, you can uh, uh, appreciate this kind of procedure. So, let us take history evaluation step 1. So, in uh, sinotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow, you should take a careful history. So, Professor David Distal from Mayo Clinic, he always used to tell, listen to what patients are saying because they are telling you the diagnosis. Mother may be telling that they, this baby is having a sinotic spell, which if you do not listen, then you will miss the diagnosis. So, any history of gradual progression of the symptoms of sinosis and shortness of breath, slow onset sinosis. Mother notices some kind of duskiness at the 3 months of age and at 1 year baby developed sinosis. After some time, so child started developing this fatting, fatting episode, then it is classically suggestive of sinotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow. So, history of sinotic spell, history of sinotic spell equivalent or squatting usually suggests that this is a case of sinotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow. Similarly, shortness of breath or fitting, not able to play with the field group, these are all associated features because of less oxygenation in this kind of children. One more important history is hyperviscosity symptom. A child who is having a sinusitis telling you that headache, dizziness or history of venous thrombosis followed by diarrhea, dehydration or followed by summer episode or history of CVA, brain acid, all these are suggestive of hyperviscosity symptom. Traditional teaching, I am sure that you are all aware that failure to thrive a growth retardation failure to thrive is a feature of a left to right hand, but in sinotic congenital heart disease reduced pulmonary blood flow, uniform growth retardation both height as well as the weight reduction will be there because of the tissue hypoxemia uh, which produces the overall growth impairment. So, 
these are all various types of DC by which you can tell that this is the synodic conjunctive arthritis which reduces pulmonary blood flow. So let us look at the tetralogy of here. In this VSC PS physiology, there is adequate mixing of both the deoxygenated and oxygenated blood, and there is obstruction to the pulmonary outflow tank. So in this condition, based on the obstruction, your pulmonary blood flow will be present and child will have that kind of symptoms. And generally speaking, these patients should not have any cardiac enlargement, they should not be any congestive heart failure. So late onset of cyanosis, history of cyanotic cells, history of spotting or spotting equivalent, no history of heart failure, no history of TVA, cerebral acid, suggestive of VSC, PS physiology. So spotting, when do you see spotting? Squatting is squatting or sinusoidal spells are all mechanisms are described. I am sure you are all aware that one of the major mechanism is a dynamic component of the infundibulum. So for some reason, this is a dynamic component of the infundibulum, infundibulum, which is uh, causes the episodic abstraction due to various autonomic nervous system involvement, endogenous cardiac element, and also unknown mechanisms that causes the synoptic cells and squatting. So classical example, wherever there is a dynamic component of the infant block, you will, you will see the manifestation of the synoptic cells. Classical example is tetralogy of yellow, double outlet right ventricle, VSC, PS, which is a normal related related vessel, because in that situation, the infant block is seen. Similarly, tetralogy of tricuspid atresia, VSC, PS, the abstraction may be from the VSC, right ventricular outflow tract and pulmonary stenosis. Similarly, a variant of single ventricle. What are the variants? You guys know what are the variants of single ventricle? So here I am talking a single ventricle with a normal related great vessel called as Holmes heart. So in Holmes heart, normal related great vessel, the bulboventricular chamber is nothing but a right ventricle which has got infant block. These babies may be present with the synoptic cells sometimes if you don't diagnose them very early in life. So let us see this history summary. A child who is presenting to you with a history of a heart failure, the yellow line, and then becoming asymptomatic, then becoming symptomatic, classically suggestive of a left to right shunt becoming uh, pulmonary, uh, developing pulmonary hypertension and becoming Eisenmenger syndrome. So, symptomatic child becoming asymptomatic and again becoming symptomatic usually suggestive of Eisenmenger syndrome, whereas a progressive gradual onset of symptoms of cyanosis and fatigue and other things usually suggestive of cyanotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow, whereas heart failure and cyanosis which is somewhat very rapidly and they will never get any kind of relief or asymptomatic stage, usually suggest to a synotic congenital heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow. They develop very early pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. So, synotic congenital heart disease with optimal pulmonary blood flow, generally asymptomatic for several years, mild dyspnea and exertion, mild cyanosis, and fatigue will be there. And usually you diagnose them during a routine examination, <laughs> routine examination. And lay, I, I want to ask you actually, what are the causes of late onset cyanosis, congenital or acquired? Any guys, late onset cyanosis. So you can see the late onset cyanosis causes acquired pulmonary AF fistulas. Acquired pulmonary AF fistulas are seen in yeah, somebody is uh, telling VSC, PS also. Acquired pulmonary AF fistulas are seen in case of liver diseases. So liver factors constantly go to lung and which keeps the pulmonary AF fistulas to be closed. Suppose if there is a liver disease, these factors will not go to the liver, uh, lung, and then pulmonary AF fistulas will be opened and there will be cyanosis. Similarly, stretched foramen oval with the right to left hand is seen classically in the PTHM. Right ventricular cardiomyopathy, examples like uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, right ventricular endocardial fibrosis, right atrial carcinoid tumors, and all will cause obstruction or increased LV, RV, EDP, leading to right atrial pressure will be high, and then there will be uh, 
shunting from the foramen ovary. Similarly, all Eisenhenger syndromes also you can classify it to a late onset cyanosis due to congenital heart disease. Congenital heart disease with a normal pulmonary blood flow. Uh, I want to ask you to type the answer. Generally, they are asymptomatic, occasional fatigue, and if you do cardiac catheterization, normal QT and QA. So, what are the causes? Cyanotic congenital heart disease with a normal pulmonary blood flow. So, you can see this is one of the cases of multiple pulmonary fistula. You can see the bubble contrast echocardiogram here. The bubble contrast echocardiogram is showing the uh, appearance of the bubbles in the left atrium after filling of the right ventricle, probably pulmonary artery here. Uh, left atrium you can see through pulmonary vein and then to uh, left ventricle here, suggestive of multiple pulmonary fistula. Similarly, here we can see another case example, child presented with cyanosis, no murmur and we have to do a contrast bubble angiogram. Here you can see the uh, connection between pulmonary artery to the left atrium. So, this is called as RPA to LA fistula. So, these are one of some of the causes for cyanosis with no significant structural heart disease and you detect only by careful meticulous evaluation. So another example which we published, you can see the superior vena cava directly draining to the left atrium. So anomalous systemic veins to left atrium. So these are all various causes for the cyanotic congenital heart disease with no significant structural heart disease. And as going to cyanotic congenital heart disease with Eisenmenger syndrome, initially there will be a heart failure with the history suggests of left duration, then becoming asymptomatic. Then late onset of cyanosis with the dyspnea and exertion classically suggests you are uh, developing Eisenmenger syndrome. So I would like to summarize here and then go to the step 2. So predominant cyanosis and related history, cyanosis, cyanotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow, cyanosis with a heart failure, cyanotic congenital heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow, a congestive heart failure patient developing asymptomatic stage. Again, developing symptoms in the form of fatigue and cyanosis usually suggestive of Eisenmenger syndrome, and late on the symptoms and then asymptomatic stage usually suggestive of cyanotic congenital heart disease or any obstructive disease with optimal pulmonary blood flow. So, second most important thing is ventricular dominance. So, if you look at the CT scan of the chest, a sagittal view here, you can see the sternum here and the right ventricle is just below the sternum. So, in general, if you ever have to palpate your right ventricle, you won't be able to palpate because it is below the sternum. So, that is what the right ventricle. So, whenever there is a dilatation or significant hypertrophy and dilatation, then you will see the right ventricle which is going either protruding and there will be parasternal pulsations here on the second space or subdivided pulsations because of the enlargement below the subdivided region. So, these are the two common things which you see whenever there is a right ventricular dominance, right ventricular hypertrophy. But in reality, cyanotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow in conditions where a non-restricted VST is present, classical example is tetral jocalo, both ventricles are sharing with equal pressure. So, you do not clinically appreciate that kind of right ventricular dominance. That means, subdivided pulsations and parasternal view will not be seen if there is a communication between the two ventricles called as non restricted PSC. But conditions like a critical PS with intact ventricular septum and the cyanosis because of the AST, where right ventricle is too much of tensed up, there will be high pressure and there is no. Every uh, ventricular septal defect, in those individuals you will see the subdivided pulsations and parasternal hue. So, in tetrachephalo, this right ventricular hue and the subdivided pulsations generally you do not appreciate. RV hue will be subtle, no parasternal pulsations, generally these patients all will have quite precardia. So, classical examples of right ventricular dominance, but still you will be able to identify to certain extent whether it is the right ventricle or left ventricle because of the effect. If the effect is not formed by the left ventricle, that is inferior and the lower most a, a classical localized apical impulse of left ventricle, if it is not there, 
probably you should be thinking it's a right ventricular attack. So conditions like tetralogy of your low, pulmonary adhesion VSC, double alternate right ventricle VSCPS, detransposition VSCPS you should keep in mind. So critical PS with AST causing a right to left hand and in those patients only you will see the a right ventricular hypertrophy, parasynathy, subdivided right ventricular Q you will be seen. So going, this is a classical example you can see the tetral FLO, non-restricted BSD, right ventricular hypertrophy, a synodic congenital heart disease with the right ventricular dominance. And this is a rare scenario where you can see ventricular dysfunction. Generally speaking, synodic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow will not have cardiomegaly unless you have a biventricular dysfunction. This particular child is was having biventricular dysfunction because of the associated other abnormalities. I, I don't want to discuss those things. So let us look at the LV dominance. If you take the external plane here, we can see the left ventricular apex, which is lowermost and outermost there. You can see the LV apex. So you will be able to palpate that the left ventricular localized apical impulse. There won't be any kind of parasternal cue. There won't be any kind of subsidiary cue. So in case of LV dominance, LV apex, no epigastric pulsations, no parasternal cue. Classical conditions are tricuspid atresia vs PS, single ventricle with PS, pulmonary atresia with intact septum. Of course, the pulmonary atresia with intact septum is a neonatal condition. We should not be bringing that diagnosis always when you are examining a child. But we should tell that this is a rare case which we can present during early infancy and the neonatal period. So, why and large? A synodic conjunct blood disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow, LV dominant, you all should know tricuspid atresia with VSCPS, single ventricle with PS. So, so let us see a couple of examples. So this is the tricuspid atresia. You can see right ventricle is too small, left ventricle is dominant here. So that's how you palpate and appreciate the localized pulse. Similarly, single ventricle you can see the only one ventricle which is giving both aorta and pulmonary artery and yes, when you palpate you will see localized area. So conditions like AVST, ventricular dysfunction, AV wall regurgitation, this is a complex AVST with a BORB and a common AV wall here. You may appreciate, you may think that both ventricle dilatation, both ventricular dominance is there. So you should keep in mind whenever there is AV wall regurgitation or ventricular dysfunction, usually it's a biventricular dysfunction, you may get a biventricular dominance in palpation. So Cardiomegaly in decreasing pulmonary blood flow situation usually due to biventricular dysfunction, valvular regurgitation or excess amount of collateral. Lot of blood is going to lungs and coming back so you will have both ventricles to dilatation and heart failure may be seen. So synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow, step 3 is examination. So examination of ventricles is step 2 great vessel. So how do you identify great vessel pulsation? So if you look at here, these patients are generally having a quite precardium. Rarely you may see a normal pulsation because of the pulmonary artery is small and iota is getting more amount of blood. So when you see normal related great vessels or when you think it, is, it may be normal related great vessels, you should keep in mind whether it may be tetralogy of fellow, double outside right ventricle, ESCPS or tricuspid atresia, ESCPS with a normal related great vessel. But when you see pulsations there, here, yeah, lateral to the mid line on the left side, what are the conditions which produce pulsations here? Usually whenever there is left and anterior iota. So left and anterior iota is nothing but L small posed great vessel. So when you have anterior left side placed iota here, then you will have pulsation conditions like Corrected TJ VS PS, single ventricle with PS, where inverted inverted chamber and double outlet right ventricle with VSD, extremely rare L mark for the great vessel association. So commonly you should be telling tangential corrected TJ VS PS, single ventricle PS with inverted vessel and rarely double outlet right ventricle VSD with L mark for the great vessel. When you see pulsations on the right side, this is commonly seen right and anterior iota. So right hand anterior iota is nothing but a demolposal great vessel. 
So, cyanotic congestion heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow with demorphosis great vessel situation, you should be thinking DTJ, BSCPS, DORV, BSCPS, single ventricle PS with demorphosis great vessel and rarely tricuspid atresia BSC with DTJ and AV canal defect PS and demorphosis great vessel. These are the orders. These are the chronological orders. So, commonest is the DTJ, DSCPS, almost always associated with the majority of the time a uh, right hand anterior right, uh, DOR with DSCPS, single ventricle PS with the demorphous, tricuspid atresia with the DTJ, PS, and the AV cannot detect PS with the D. So, you should remember that. You may get the opportunity occasionally to look for the pulsations on the right suprasternal region. Suppose you see right suprasternal region, you may consider that right atrial cord is producing those kind of pulsations like a tetralogy of hello, pulmonary atresia, BSC are the two conditions you should keep in mind. So, this is one of the case example of demorphosis gate vessel with the right atrial cord. You can see the, uh, the athenic aorta is on the right side here. So, no wonder that it can produce the pulsations on the right parasternal. Similarly, you can see one more example here. The ascending aorta is extremely right here in a DTJ VSC PS situation, and you can imagine that this ascending aorta, because this is the only bigger vessel, will produce the uh, pulsations of the uh, right and anterior. So, this is an angiographic still picture of LTJ, character TJ, where ascending aorta is on left side here, you can see here left side, and this will produce the pulsations of the left side. So, from your point, you should be able to diagnose to certain extent. I won't say that 100% we are accurate in identifying this, but you should look for at least. You should look and make an attempt to diagnose whether great vessel pulsations are there or not. Even if you don't see, you can tell the examiner by looking for the great vessel pulsations with the D or L, then they appreciate that you have a common sense approach. So, correctly TJ VSCPS, single medical PS, and rarely DRB VSCPS with the L more positive gradient. This is the right aortic cut which I have discussed. So, let us go to the fourth step called second heart sound. So, second heart sound, normally appreciable second heart sound is very rare in VSCPS physiology because the amount of blood goes across the right ventricular outflow tract usually which it determines the tissue component, pulmonary component. In a tetralogy of fellow, you have a cyanotic cell and the severe cyanosis, your tissue may be totally absent. You don't appreciate the tissue even phonocardiographically. There are tetralogy of fellow, pink tetralogy of fellow, loud murmur, less cyanosis, you may appreciate a soft pulmonary component. So, tetralogy of fellow, for an example, pulmonary component may be absent, may be soft, Occasionally, you may appreciate very rarely well where things are all their fellows. Whereas, the demorphosis great vessel situation, where iota is anterior, iota is anterior here, and iota is getting more amount of blood, pulmonary arteries are getting less amount of blood. So, QS is very high and iota is anterior. So, in those situations, you will appreciate a single loud second heart sound is nothing but iotic component. And so, those, these two differences I request you to keep in mind. So, next coming to the sound ejection click. Ejection click is a rare entity in case of BSCPS physiology, but when you appreciate the ejection click, PS with intact ventricular septum and AST producing cyanosis, and you are confused that is a case of BSCPS physiology, if you appreciate ejection click, that usually suggests it's a case of severe pulmonary stenosis. But mind you, the pulmonary component is usually soft because of the amount of blood flow across the right ventricular outflow tract is very less. Sometimes ejection click may not be appreciable because of the immobility or calcified pulmonary valve also. Whereas in case of tetralogy of fellow, 30%, nearly one third of all children with a tetralogy of fellow, you may appreciate the ejection click that is essentially because of the dilated ascending aorta, where a lot of blood will go through the ascending aorta, will produce the ejection plate. So, most important aspects are again murmur, that is step 5, where you 
appreciate most of the time ejection systolic murmur. So in BSD PS physiology, the pulmonary ejection systolic murmur is related directly to the amount of the blood. So if you have good amount of blood across the RV body, you will have a loud murmur. If you have less amount of blood, you will have a less intensified murmur. So if the murmur is louder, cyanosis is lesser, obviously, because of the less amount of blood flow. So if murmur is louder, cyanosis is less, good amount of blood, whereas if the murmur is shorter, more cyanosis because of the less amount of blood is going across the right ventricular outflow tank. Typically, if you examine a baby, during cyanotic spell, there won't be any murmur. So once the baby improves from the cyanotic spell, then you will start appreciating the ejection systolic murmur suggests that good amount of blood is going across the right ventricular outflow tank. So generally speaking, less amount of cyanosis, good amount of pulmonary blood flow, and a louder murmur. But there are conditions where you will appreciate disproportionate to finding. Like here, cyanosis is significant, murmur also is significant. Loud murmur and more cyanosis. So disproportionate murmur and cyanosis. Clinically disproportionate cyanosis and murmur usually suggest that transcription physiology. So that means whatever the venous return, systemic venous return which is coming, which is going to iota, whatever the pulmonary venous return which is going to pulmonary artery with an obstruction. So good amount of blood is going to lens, but whatever blood which is only oxygenated blood, so you will have a child with severe cyanosis, but still significant murmur will be there. So disproportionate cyanosis and to the degree of murmur usually suggests you of it's a DTGA, VSC, PS or related conditions of uh, whatever it is, cyanotic congenital heart disease, VSC, PS with the demolposin grade weather. So in top physiology, these are the variants which you should uh, remember. So let us have a differential point between VSC, PS and pulmonary artery intact septum. If you look at the JVP A wave, which is normal in case of VSC, PS, whereas in case of PS is intact septum, it is prominent wave. Harassinal heave is absent in case of GYF physiology. Harassinal heave is present in PS with intact septum. Cardiomegaly is not a feature of VSCPS, which I told you. It is present in case of pulmonary critical PS and intact septum. Ejection click is uncommon in case of VSCPS physiology, which is commonly seen here. And ejection systolic murmur is a short and probably loud depending on the blood flow in case of VSCPS physiology, where this is long through the systolic which is present in case of critical PS with intact septum and usually S3 and S4 are absent in case of VSCPS, whereas it is just present and sometimes it, you may appreciate in the PS and the B, intact septum if there is a ventricular dysfunction. Coming to the JVB A wave, which may be prominent as the age advances in case of VSCPS, or prominence of B wave if they develop a tricuspid regurgitation, you, you will see in some cases. So I am sure that you are all aware of the diastolic murmurs in cyanotic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow or increased pulmonary blood flow. Due to aortic regurgitation, diastolic murmur is seen in case of cataraglia fellow or pulmonary atresia. Of course, truncus, I don't want to classify here, but for the sake of information, I am telling you. Truncus also, truncal wall regurgitation you will see and produce diastolic murmur at the place. Similarly, pulmonary regurgitation murmur, Eisenmenger syndrome or tetralogy of yellow with absent pulmonary wall syndrome, classically you will see two and four murmur in this case scenario. A murmur across the tricuspid flow, that is tricuspid flow rumble, you will see in case of Epstein's anomaly and TAPVR which is actually a cyanotic congenital heart disease which increases pulmonary blood flow. I just want to tell you the diastolic murmur so that's why I am considering this. And due to mitral flow turbulence, you will see any cyanotic congenital heart disease which increases pulmonary blood flow with the LV dominant. Coming to the pan-systolic murmur in VSCPS physiology. Generally, you don't appreciate pan-systolic murmur. Always you appreciate ejection systolic murmur. But for some reason, if you appreciate a pan-systolic murmur in a clinically suspected VSCPS physiology, you should think that the pan-systolic murmur is due to AV wall regurgitation that is commonly seen in case of atrial ventricular septal defect 
and tangential selected TGA, left-sided histinoid abnormality leading to the mitral, uh, the left-sided avival regurgitation, which produces cancerous muscle. Similarly, in case of tricuspid atresia, you will see a long systolic hybrid murmur due to abstraction from the BST, RVOD, and pulmonary stenosis. So, you have various degrees of abstraction in tricuspid atresia starting from BST, infantilum, pulmonary valvular abstraction that produces a long systolic murmur in this condition. So, the favorite question to most of the examiners are continuous murmurs in BST, BST physiology. So continuous murmur, you when you appreciate in a post-operative condition, a synodic congenital or this is a reduced pulmonary blood flow, VSCPS, underwent a palliative operation and continuous murmur characteristically suggests a iota pulmonary shunt, a modified BT shunt or attending iota to RPA shunt and historically a partial shunt you may appreciate left side or back of the but that is not the, we have seen only three cases recently. Pulmonary atresia BST with the collateral, tetralogy of yellow with the patent ductus arteriosis or any synoptic congenital heart disease with the reduced pulmonary blood flow associated with the patent ductus arteriosis. These are the conditions where you appreciate continuous muscle in BST PS with the physiology. So this is an example of pulmonary atresia with the BST where multiple collaterals, if you auscultate back of the chest, interscapular region, axilla and infraclavicular region, you all appreciate the continuous muscle so that is due to collateral. So this is a, another example, you can see the PT shunt and I am sure that you all appreciate that the continuous murmur in the right or left infra, infraclavicular region. So this is the classical to and fro. You can see the blood is going into the pulmonary artery from right ventricle with an obstruction and regurgitation. So synodic congenital heart disease, reduced pulmonary blood flow, cardiac enlargement and the heart failure usually you see in tetralogy of with oxygen pulmonary valve syndrome or PS and TR, uh, critical PS, axial anomaly and endocardial cushion defect with the MR and character TJ, BS, PS with uh, again a left sided avial vegetation, you will see this kind of two and two murmur. Absence anomaly is a different entity, generally, we, we will uh, discuss in all entities where fight precardium, single second heart sound, multiple sound, and scratch it like a fit murmur, AD sound, all these variable sounds will be seen, and you can read about that. So, I will just skip off this slide, I put it this for MBBS level. I, I do not think we should be discussing about the common sense approach here. I am sure that you are all aware of the area of the members and all. So, summary of the clinical findings in BSC, PS, and physiology, then you have palpable left ventricle, tricuspid atresia, single ventricle, pulmonary atresia, intact septum, pulsating from the second heart, second intercostal phase, lateral to the mid circular line, L mark was a great vessel, character TJ, single ventricle, and the complex congenital heart disease where left and anterior iota, murmur louder than sinosis. There is a severe sinosis and a murmur, usually mal positive great vessel, presence of pan murmur, AV septal defect, character TJ with the left eval regurgitation, double outlet right ventricle, and uh, tricuspid atresia where they have long systolic murmur. Presence of pulmonary regurgitation murmur, either Ryzen Menu syndrome or tetral jacal with oxygen pulmonary wall syndrome. I will just to quickly go a couple of examples. When you ask it to choose X-ray or ECG, X-ray will give information about cardiomegaly due to dilatation and pulmonary vascularity. So when you are in a confused state to decide vascularity, you have to choose the X-ray and if you want to identify the cardiac enlargement, you have to choose the chest X-ray. When you are interested in looking at the ventricular dominance, ventricular hypertrophy, then you have to take ECG. So here let us look at a couple of examples. I am sure you all know this is the classical bull shaped heart and the reduced pulmonary blood flow, alginia is there. So what will happen in tetralogy of hello? Because of the malarite VST and the dextral position of the iota, iota actually faces right ventricle as well as the left ventricle, whatever the systemic blood which directly faces to the iota. So your right ventricle takes a shape to press the systemic uh, flow, that means iota, right ventricle moves upward little bit to press the iota because of the less amount of blood it has to pump into the pulmonary artery. So it will produce a full shepherd heart here. 
So what is this condition? Anybody, a synoptic tangential artery with uh, reduced pulmonary blood flow, Yakra, you are seeing here, a normal cardiothoracic ratio, and you can see a grossly dilated some structures. Anybody, guys, what is this condition? Somebody can type. Hello? Uh, no, there's, yeah, uh, who is that? Santosh. Very good. This is tetrasiafalo absent pulmonary valve syndrome. You can see the grossly dilated pulmonary artery and reduced pulmonary blood flow and there is no cardiomegaly. So, very good. So, let us see. This is a tetrasiafalo who underwent a palliative surgery, a shunt surgery sometime back on the left side. So, he developed pulmonary hypertension. So you can see the left pulmonary artery is dilated here and there is a little bit of right pulmonary artery. This is a post-operative part shunt. I want to show you a rare case, a post-operative part shunt. You can't diagnose this radiologically but you can tell that pulmonary arteries are dilated. So anybody taken a synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow situation, clinically there is a long systolic murmur and the single second heart sound. Uh, a synosis is present. What is the X-ray? So somebody wrote right arch, somebody wrote fantastic. Who is that? Uh, Venu. Venu. Correct. Tricuspid atresia. Why did you say tricuspid atresia? What made you to tell tricuspid atresia? It can be DORB, it can be tricuspid atresia. Yes. See, what you can see here is abrupt cutoff of right heart border. So when you have abrupt cutoff of right heart border, usually suggest that the right atrial appendages are not there in the normal position. So normally right atrial appendage and the right atrium forms the right heart border. Whenever you have a juxtaposed atrial appendage, that is the right atrial appendage goes on the left side, you will have a situation called abrupt cutoff of right heart border which is characteristically most often associated with the tricuspid atresia. You will get this kind of situation in anatomical malquotient, single ventricle and DTGA and DORB. But the commonest thing, commonest thing is that synoptic congenital heart disease, reduced pulmonary blood flow, VSDPS physiology, right heart border is absent or abrupt right heart border cut off. You should tell tricuspid atresia, DORB, DSCPS or other DTGA VSDPS. So, this X-ray, again a synoptic congenital heart disease, reduces pulmonary blood flow and mild synosis, loud murmurs. You can see on the left side here a bulge that is nothing but acidic ureter. I am sure now by this time you all got the diagnosis. This is l positive great vessel. This is the LTJ VSTPS. So to summarize radiological finding, tetralogy of yellow, no cardiac enlargement, right ventricular complex present and reduce in pulmonary blood flow, DRV, DTJ, sometimes cardiac enlargement, tricuspid atresia, SVC dominant, right atrial enlargement, LV effect, and you will you may see abrupt right heart border cut off in 20% of the cases. L malposit rate result, LTGA, prominence in inferior area usually suggests of a single ventricle and other things. So let us take a couple of PCG examples and then we will complete our story. So this is an infant with a synoptic cell uh, and there is a murmur 2 by 6 ejection systolic murmur. So what is the diagnosis? So whenever you are asked the, an ECG, you can type the diagnosis, I will discuss the finding. A totally DCG, very good, it is a tetralogy of Tadu. A totally DCG here, which is showing a normal sinus rhythm, CR interval is normal, QRS axis is normal and there is right is ventricle of dominance here you can see the tall R waves in B1 and uh, uh, a deep S waves in B5 and B6 suggestive of it's a tetralogy of fellow, BSC, PS, physiology with right ventricle of dominance. So synoptic congenital heart disease with a reduced pulmonary blood flow with uh, right ventricle of dominance. As the age advances in tetralogy of fellow, what will happen? This is the classical example, an adult end uh, with the tetralogy of fellow, you can see that the right atrial enlargement is becoming much more prominent in B1 and L2 here. And you can see a monopathic heart here and a 
deep as we in we say it is just a classical a uh, right ventricular dominance similarly you can see here a uh, right axis deviation which is significant so right ventricular enlargement a uh, right axis deviation a uh, prominent rv forces and you see as the age advances and here what you can see is there is a heart rate which is relatively low suggestive of bradycardia it may be on beta blocker and most important thing here v1 to v2 there is a sudden change in the qrs pattern you can see v1 monophasic car whereas v2 here there is equiphasic complex this is called as sudden transition sudden transition is a feature of tetrahedral cell i am going to tell you how it comes up in the next slide so as the age advances you can see the p wave is much more dominant that is the right ventricle is becoming more and more non compliant so stiff right ventricle right ventricle gdp is high right atrial filling pressures are high so you have right atrial enlargement here and the right ventricular hypertrophy you can see here so let us see what will happen in tetrahedral cell this is tetrahedral cell here if you place the precardial lead v1 corresponds to right atrium v2 corresponds to the infant bulb and v3 v4 v5 v6 will be there so the infant bulb is a structure it is electrically insulated structure that means electrical wires are insulated you don't get any kind of shock similarly infant bulb is electrically inactive structure so there won't be any voltage as generated from that area so you will have an equiphasic complex here you are seeing right ventricular hypertrophy whereas as soon as you go to v2 because of the cancellation of energy of right ventricle left ventricle you will see equiphasic complex so that's how the transition is produced this is the closest hypothesis which i can give you for the transition so when you have a conduction like that you will see the right ventricular uh, hypertrophy and then v2 will show you a sudden transition there so what is this condition so i am going to ask you guys tell me complete heart block is seen av nodal disease is seen in synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow tell me four condition yes correct is a one everybody answer i want three more condition avst fantastic answer i enjoy your answer very good avst next absence fantastic excellent one more so one more okay you are giving me opportunity to tell a single very good single ventricle with more specific inverted chamber a single ventricle with inverted chamber where conduction system passes through that is acts like a ctj again i have a patient of 46 years old gentleman with a single ventricle inverted chamber and complete heart block we have to give him a dual chamber pacemaker so remember correct is a vst ps in a synoptic congenital heart disease reduced pulmonary blood flow avst vst ps single ventricle inverted chambers with ps and rarely absence anomaly very good this is a case of a correct is a i'll show you so what will happen in correct is a normally there should be a av node which is located a little bit posterior which is absent in this or abnormal there are anteriorly located av node which is much more elongated elongated so it elongates over the period of time and they develop the uh, conduction disturbances here so if you look at the natural history of character disease they develop 1% per patient year of dhd over the period of time so this is a natural itself they develop a heart block because of abnormally anteriorly placed elongated av node so this is one of the uh, reason why they develop a heart block you all should be aware of that so this is what what you see a qvs supposed to present v5 v6 which is absent and which is seen usually in case of v3 or v4 or and v1 these are nothing but a septal qvs which is if you see in case of right sided lead that suggests it is a correct tg so this is an infant again Uh, presented with the synoptic and the synoptic cell and there is a systolic murmur and uh, the pediatrician took this ecg to adult cardiologist before telling the age they said it is normal so how many you agree this is abnormal and uh, how many tell 
the reasons for a synoptic congenital heart disease with reduced pulmonary blood flow, this kind of uh, ECG. So, tricuspid atresia, very good. Tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia, VSC, double outlet, double inlet, left ventricle, nothing but a single ventricle. So, remember these three conditions when you are talking about a left axis deviation and there are left ventricular forces, that means LV dominance and right ventricular forces are absent. So, that is how in case of tricuspid atresia, a right ventricle is too small and left ventricle is dominant. So, so far, this is the most important thing. So far, I have been telling you in a VSC PSS physiology that is synoptic congenital heart disease, reduced pulmonary blood flow, a concordance of frontal plane QRS axis to precardial voltages. That means if you have right axis deviation, you will see right ventricular forces. Classical example, tetralogy of If you have left axis deviation, you will see left ventricular forces. The classical example is tricuspid atresia has to be a single ventricle. But in this case scenario, you can see here a right axis deviation but left ventricular dominance. So, frontal plane QRS axis to precardial QRS is disproportionate. It is not concordant, it is discordant. QRS axis to QRS progression discordance, if you see, you will think it is a single ventricle. That is absolutely correct single ventricle. So, you all should think whenever there is a frontal plane QRS axis to precardial position discordant, you should think a single ventricle. So, in single ventricle again you can read, I don't have much time to explain. This is another pattern of single ventricle where you see a stereotypic pattern or monomorphic pattern, monophasic pattern, V1 to V6 you can see only monophasic R is seen. This is another pattern of single ventricle. So, my dear students, to summarize today's talk in a synoptic congenital heart disease, right ventricular dominance, tetralogy of yellow, double outlet right ventricle, tetralogy of yellow pulmonary atresia, TGA, TFEBR, and common atrium, left ventricular dominance, tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia, intact septum, hypopulsic right heart syndrome, and single ventricle and essence anomaly, biventricular forces, truncus, and double outlet right ventricle sometimes you will see. There is a normal ECG you see. Our normal systemic venous return on pulmonary venous, pulmonary fistula. So, I will conclude my session. If you have any questions, you can send me email. Uh, I can send you the PDF version of the today's presentation. I request to send you your feedback so that we can improve our teaching session to all of you. Thank you very much. I will be online. If you have any questions, you can tell me. I can talk to you in the next five minutes. So, good. So, you all feel it's useful? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vimala. How do you differentiate ESC PSA from TOP? TOP is nothing but a kind of ESC PSA physiology. So, what you are asking, I understand that VSC PS means a ventricular septal defect with the vulvar pulmonary stenosis where left to right shunt is seen. So, you, you do not appreciate much stenosis in those individuals and you will uh, appreciate a good ejection systolic murmur and sometimes all the ejection peak may be appreciated. So, in general, VSCPS physiology means it is a top physiology. We are talking physiology. Whereas anatomical VSCPS and tetralogy of are entirely different, where you may not be having a malaline VSC, you may not be having a by, uh, mixing of both deoxygenated and oxygenated blood. So, you, you should see the differences like that. Maybe I can talk it to you more in detail later. So, if there are no questions, I request all of you to revise your VSCPS physiology. Everybody will get this kind of case in the exam. So, you go and do stepwise and telling the examinations also for the synopsis, history, then examination, palpation then observation, then great, uh, before that is great results and all. Thank you very much.